Thank you. I'll call to order the August 11th meeting of the Public Affairs Committee. Um, first, um, I'm going to take a couple of moments to read a statement, uh, and it's one that I'm sad to have to make. Last week, the Cheltenham community lost an esteemed leader. Brian Malloy had served Cheltenham as an elected member of the school board during the mid 20 teens. Brian Malloy was named Philadelphia Teacher of the Year in 2009. He co-founded Cheltenham Pickleball and taught pickleball for both the Cheltenham Township Adult School and the Township Department of Parks and Recreation. He was an advocate for people, for fitness, and for fun. And Brian Malloy made you feel like you could believe in yourself. One friend talks about Brian's great presence, noting how he greeted everyone by name and with a huge smile, validating them and their day. He was a real gentleman, said a colleague. Another emphasized his lifelong love of learning and his acknowledgement of each individual's positive contributions. This colleague shared the following quote from educator Scott Hayden. Teachers have three loves, love of learning, love of learners, and the love of bringing the first two loves together. Most of us who knew Brian Malloy were so taken by his energy, his initiative and positive spirit that we didn't imagine this moment ever coming and we're still stunned. Our hearts and our prayers are with his family. We'll try to keep his spirit alive, but we already miss him profoundly. Thank you. Um, we'll turn to the regular items on the agenda. Uh, item number one, is there any discussion? On those reports. Um, I'll just mention that uh, Alan Brown, the board does uh, notice how much of the work depends on what you're doing. Um, is there any particular update with the pools? Mr. Hinson? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, um, Madam Chair. Uh, for the pools, everything's running fine right now. Um, we're in the August, uh, things are slowing down. Um, we're still fully staffed, um, but we do have people starting to leave in the next couple of weeks. Um, and maintenance wise, uh, everything's still running and doing great. So we're, uh, we're gonna make it to Labor Day. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I will also send out a congratulations uh, to Lauren uh, Cartledge in the uh, Public Information Office. Okay, uh, so if there's no other uh, comments on um, item one, I'll take a motion to receive. I move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, item number two, receipt of the committee meeting minutes. Um, there were a couple. Uh, are there any comments? And I know we, we have members, uh, it looked like we had some members in the audience from some of those committees. Any, any outstanding comments? Okay, I'll take a motion to receive. So moved. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Same with the staff meeting minutes. Uh, any comments on those two meetings? I'll move receipt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number four. Welcome to Margaret Griffin uh, of the Cheltenham Center for the Arts. And it's good to see you. Tell Thank us what's you. happening. It's good to see you too. <laughs> um, well, I, I really am glad to see you, and it it's, uh, seems very strange to be in this forum instead of over at the Arboretum, but here we are in, uh, in August. 
So I, I don't have um, my normal financials to give you tonight. Um, I, I will have again soon. We, uh, my bookkeeper has been out for a little while and we're changing over our system. But I suspect that probably you're not so interested in the nitty gritty line items of my <laughs> budget this year as much as you are interested in what's happening at all. I, I really think it's been more than a year since we've spoken. So um, it's unlike me to read something to you, but instead I, I, I am going to read something. I had to write a report on kind of the state of our situation uh, for another forum recently. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I thought I would just read you a piece of it and then kind of tell you where we're going next. So here's, here's a little state of, the, state of the center. The Cheltenham Center for the Arts fulfills its mission by providing comprehensive, affordable arts programming. The center primarily serves residents of Cheltenham Township and the surrounding Montgomery County communities. Prior to the pandemic, CCA's yearly programming included seven to eight visual arts exhibitions, 150 in-person visual arts and theater classes for children and adults offered in five eight-week sessions per year, a 10-week summer arts camp, uh, program camp for 130 to 150 young people ages five to 12 and 30 more teenagers, a family fun day, which offers a free hands-on activities, performances, and student art show for local families. In February of 2020, just before the pandemic, uh, we hosted 200 people at that event. 46 theater and musical performances and an artist residency program, which offers studio space and exhibition opportunities to three to four artists per year and monthly artist critique days. In March of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic forced the center to cancel all of its regular programming and shift its educational offerings online. CCA is proud of the fact that the center was able to pivot during this time and remain nimble with its educational offerings as guidelines and occupancy restrictions changed. In the summer of 2020, the center offered its summer camp as a morning only virtual program with some supplemental outdoor classes. In September of 2020, CCA began offering some programs, exhibitions, and classes on site with significantly limited capacity, including hybrid and socially distanced classes, while continuing to offer online classes. Performing arts programming was limited to an outdoor performance in October by a children's theater company, Cine Tumore. The company had originally planned to present a series of plays at CCA throughout the year of 2020. And then one artist residency was offered starting in September. In 2021 to date, CCA has offered the following program still at a limited capacity. Three exhibitions, the Artessa Alliance Biennial, the annual member show and our juried painting show. There were no in-person offerings, receptions. All three shows accepted limited capacity in-person viewing by appointment only each show had a virtual opening. We offered 52 classes for children and adults offered during um, three four-week sessions and one eight-week session. Classes are in-person with strict capacity limits. No performances or concerts were offered in our theater from March 2020 through June of 2021. An indoor performance was held in July at half capacity and we are planning to resume our concert series in October with Jazz Bridge at half capacity if conditions allow. Uh, some of you may know that we also closed our Elkins Park gift shop in March of this year. We, um, we are planning an online offering and some monthly pop-ups again as conditions allow. CCA is currently offering its full day, 10 week summer camp program in person, but at a reduced capacity of 80% with significant COVID restrictions, masks, social distancing, a parent child waiver and a revamped use of our educational space. Adult classes are continuing as well, mostly in person with occupancy restrictions. This fall, the center will continue to offer a mixture of online and on-site programming shifting the format and structure as COVID restrictions evolve. Throughout the pandemic, CCA has worked hard to accommodate the needs of its community 
students, family, and artists, the center's teachers, modified their classes and structures, in some cases created entirely new classes that enabled students of all ages, even those with limited technology experience, to produce work of value via online instruction. The center offered virtual openings, investing in technology to film artworks on display, and held its fall fundraising event and art auction entirely online. Offering opportunities to participate in the arts is particularly important right now as our community enters the 18th months of living with the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna say um, I, I've listened to others on this meeting thank their employees and constituents. And I, I just have to say our teachers through this from the very get-go were just, just intrepid. They were just astounding. Um, from, from people who have literally not owned a computer to people who, you know, felt like it was no big deal. Most of them, many, many of them said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I'll, I'll give it a try. And even the ones who said, oh, I can never do this, um, did end up doing it. And, uh, and several of our students as well, the same thing. Many students who felt like, oh, I could never take a class online eventually felt like I, you know, they missed their art community, the camaraderie of even just seeing each other online. Um, and eventually many, many of them tried. So it's been, you know, uh, an emotional time for, for so many people and, and for the Art Center as well. Um, I will give you just a few numbers. Our fiscal year, as you recall, probably, um, goes from June 1st to May 31st. So this means that last year when the pandemic started, we were just at the end of a fiscal year and a quite successful one. So it was very sad in many ways. Um, and then we start our year with summer camp. So the, the camp, whatever happens in summer camp sets the tone for the success of the year. So last year, um, we started, let me just say that two years ago, a normal summer camp season is somewhere between $88,000 and $90,000. Um, last year, we ran, uh, we, we did pivot, we did offer the camp. There were some people we took that took the camp and, and had a good time, um, but we ran it at about 24%. So we made, um, you know, $20,000, $23,000 last year during summer camp from 88 in the previous year. Um, as comparison, this year, we are at 67,000, I'm happy to say. So still, still down by, you know, 30 something percent, uh, but significantly better. So when we started last year with that, with that, just a little bit of uh, summer camp. Then we moved into some online classes again and some in-person classes. Again, a normal eight-week session for us in terms of the adult classes um, should be about $30,000, $34,000. So last fall we ran, you couldn't even say the number, by the time we got to winter we ran at about $14,000. Then another 14,000, then 17,000, then 19,000. So you can see that we were way, way, way down. Came back up, averaged at about a 50% uh, uh, loss. And now we're running at about a 60, 60, 65% capacity. So it's been a slow climb, but there has been a climb. Um, in the summer, um, we are just back to that COVID restriction conversation. Um, we have mandated masks inside uh, because the children are here and unvaccinated. Uh, we have changed many ways that we use our space and, and are using the outside. We um, did mandate a vaccine for all the staff that was working with children, but we did not do that with staff that is working with adults. Uh, however, now we have certainly gone back to the masks only inside. So um, I will say that the, the year ended, the fiscal year ended, this last fiscal year ended um, 
down about 27,000. Uh, last year, we ended up about close to 4,000. So that's quite a difference. We would have had we not missed that entire spring session of last year, had a really great year last year. Um, and I'm surprised, frankly, that it, that it wasn't a little bit worse. Um, we ran the staff this year with one full-time employee, me, with um, a pay cut. We ran with one part-time employee who eventually went um, on unemployment for a period. And then I did not fill my third staff position. Um, during the year, we cut every single expense that we could possibly cut. Uh, and, and, and so that's what happened. We did um, receive a PPP loan earlier in the year and uh, a grant from Montgomery County in the middle of the year to help us buy some equipment so that we could put air purifiers in the classrooms. And we have several pending grants that, that I'm hoping are going to help us significantly. And I'll be able to report to you on maybe by next month. Um, I can, I can say, I wanna say one last thing about like what, what's just about to come up. We did, we are, we have just um, started to post all of our fall classes. We are going to print a fall brochure, which we did not certainly do that last year. We will um, open our um, fall season of gallery openings with our resident and our, that single, that terrific single artist and resident that was here with us during this pandemic. We'll have her finally get to have her solo show. In September, her name is Karen Hunter McLaughlin, and the show is beautiful. Um, there will also be a collage group that opens at that same time. We will run our fall fundraising program, and our children's theater is coming back. So we are at this moment planning as though we are having a season. We still have two more weeks of summer camp, um, and and I can say that the upside is that if, if this all does go really wrong from a pandemic perspective in the next few weeks, um, we have learned an awful lot. And we are, um, we know we are able to teach a class online at this point. We know, you know, how to run the opening and how to run the event, et cetera. All sorts of things that we did not know how to do at this time last year. Thank you. That was a very positive way to, to present <laughs> it. Uh, Commissioner Norris. Yeah, uh, Margaret, thank you. Uh, you actually answered two of my questions I was going to ask about the county grants and the PPP loans. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll simply say uh, uh, thank you for the very thorough report. Uh, we have missed seeing you at Curtis uh, and the center. It's a jewel in the township. Uh, so thank you very much for the work you do. Thank you. Madam Chairperson? Yes, Commissioner Sigmund Feld. Uh, first of all, Margaret. Congratulations on the amount of recovery that you've had, because given COVID and given circumstances, uh, particularly in 2020 to 2021, the numbers that you shared tell us that you've you know made some significant adjustments in a couple <laughs> levels. So so, kudos to you for that, and hopefully, um, the adjustments and the learnings that you've done can allow you to continue to both recover and even get past that break-even point. I do have a couple of questions. Are there any issues in terms of the condition of the building, the art center? Because I know historically we've, you know, we're we are across the township looking at all of our facilities and looking mm -hmm. to identify and understand uh, situations that are going to enable us to continue to use buildings or cause us to have reasons for for you know wanting to make adjustments in that. So tell us if you can just give us any. Are there any major issues or things that have been uncovered or discussed with respect to the conditions in the uh, in the building? Well, there have been some things, and I, I know that the township is, has this on their radar. Um, I've had some visits from uh, members of the township staff uh, to look at the building recently, especially after our recent storms. And so, you know, I have been able to report a couple of things. There's, um, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything tragic in the sense of like the roof has not fallen in or anything, but I will say that um, there are ongoing concerns about the state of the building. Um, it, is a, it is a very old building. It floods. 
the uh, water runoff from the roof has caused some, some damage. Um, the parking lot is changing and, and uh, has some, um, uh, I guess you could call it pits in it that make me concerned. Um, there, you know, there, there's uh, maintenance stuff that, that is, that, that continues. The HVAC issues in the theater, et cetera, are not new, um, nor are they weather related. But the, you know, so the more recent things that I know you all have been tracking are, are weather related. Um, so I very, very much appreciate and I'm happy to say that, that the township helped take this huge, huge dead tree uh, down that was on the property, at the front of the property, uh, that I felt like was a liability issue, a safety issue in order, in terms of us having children return for summer camp. So that that got taken care of in March, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Okay. The other question I have relates to the, some of the adjustments that you've made seem to, to be in the area of you know, moving more to technology. So two questions, do you have adequate technology assets as the threats of COVID are gonna to continue to make in-person learning and that kind of thing more of a challenge? And th so the second part of this is, have you learned enough or are there models for art centers that are moving away from that in-person and moving more into the technology platform? So I wanna understand that you either know what you need have a sense of you know, how to evolve given the, the situation. And then the last piece is, are there things that you need to ask of us to help you continue to move in that technology model? I'll answer part of that and I might have to think about it a little bit to answer more completely. Um, I would say that the building itself has you know, a Wi-Fi access that is kind of medium in terms of its effectiveness. It is a really old building with really thick walls and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always work beautifully, but it does work. Um, many of the teachers that taught this last year online taught from their homes as, as many did in other places. Um, we have run some classes, you know, on, on site. Um, I would say that in order to move forward from a technology perspective, we would need to do, I mean, to really like take a leap forward. Um, I would need to hire a different employee. And so that outstanding, um, that outstanding position that I hope I'm gonna be able to fill soon, the one that has not been filled for a year, uh, really should be filled with somebody who has a good amount of knowledge in this, in this area. We have um, a lot of, um, uh, well-meaning, well-intentioned, and fairly well-informed people who are willing to help. But it would be much better if we had somebody who was sort of dedicated to figuring out how to move forward. So, you know, we did things like bought a um, a, a pretty uh, pretty decent video camera, for example, that could help us do uh, those online openings. But it would be better if I had I, I ended up having to pay somebody offsite, a contractor to edit that video that we took and really make it so that it was presentable for, for uh, an online presentation. So Are any of those grants that you've applied for, do they relate to technology enhancements and that kind of thing? And are there those available that you could go after given that direction? Yes, and um, I would say some of the grants is, some, most of the grants that we've applied for have been uh, about, um, more concrete, you know, providing um, safety protections, ventilation systems, um, payroll, etc. Uh, but yes, we certainly have talked about, you know, ways that we needed to provide technology to move forward. And, and again, if I can restaff that position, that will be that will be part of it. Thank you, and congratulations on the progress that you've made in very trying times. Thank you. And anybody else? Would you be able to give us a copy, uh, you know, send us an email with your remarks so that we can review? Sure, absolutely. Again, uh, that, that would be very helpful. And- Who would you uh, guys send? Allison? Yeah, and then Allison will send them to the rest of us. Okay. Uh, whoever okay. wants them. That would be great. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, we appreciate all that went into that and all the creativity.
um, in many ways that you guys provide us. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll receive a, uh, a, I'll take a motion to receive uh, that report. So move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Item uh, five, report of the township manager, Mr. Zinkaski. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, the first item we have is discussion and possible recommendation for approval to implement a new township health insurance program starting January 1st, 2022. Um, just a couple of things to lead into this. Um, you know, as the board has looked into this since the time I've been here, uh, you know, it's one of the biggest expenses the township has outside of payroll. Um, so it's one that's always needs to be looked at, monitored, and then managed as well. But just a couple statements, if I can begin with, is that um, as we look at this, I know rumors get around and want to try to dispel some of these uh, in that all three collective bargaining agreements guarantee members of each respective bargaining unit uh, certain health insurance coverages. Uh, each of the CBAs authorized the township to change the carrier plan so long as the coverage under the new plan remains unchanged for the prior coverage. Uh, this is something that has been recognized and I believe we have accomplished that in the proposal that will be forthcoming. Uh, Independence Blue Cross Blue Shield, who uh, I will be looking to recommend, has promised that the coverage will match divot its coverage and there'll be no loss or reduction in any employee's insurance coverage. Um, one of the big things I've heard in the time, uh, again, being here is uh, the health center that Divot had set up. Uh, I wanna say, and I wanna thank uh, the Nova insurance partners in working hard uh, to put a plan in place uh, to have that type of setup, to have a health center with the primary care office, uh, which would be cl in closer distance from where the divot office is, uh, that would allow employees to access phys physician care at a zero, zero dollar copay. Uh, I think that's key. I think it's uh, very important, again, uh, for the staff who, again, for themselves, for family members, you know, health care is important, as well as for our retirees. Um, when you look at Aetna, who is currently the provider, compared to uh, Independence Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think those are two of the top insurance um, providers, health insurance providers. And uh, again, I want to uh, commend um, the Villanova uh, insurance partners. Uh, and through this partnership uh, with the Benecon Group, was able to obtain a proposal um, through the Pennsylvania Municipal Health Insurance Corporation, which is I guess known as PIMIC, P-M-H-I-C, on behalf of Cheltenham. And that is a program developed and administered by the Benecon Group for a number of municipalities in Pennsylvania. Uh, Independence Blue Cross is the network used within the PIMIC program. Uh, employees of the township would now have their health insurance covered through uh, Independence Blue Cross. And again, this is being brought forward tonight so that if it's the board's desire to move forward with this, that there is plenty of time uh, for employees to be able to know the transition period, uh, how this works, um, to make sure that it's not a two week thing, it's months of time of planning the transition so that everyone can feel assured that uh, they're going to get a quality healthcare program. Uh, and if Madam Chair, if it'd be okay, if I could turn this over to um, Chris Whitney and the Villanova insur Insurance Partners to continue on. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, I just want to say a brief statement about the, the program uh, through Benecon. Uh, the PIMIC program, like you said, like Bob said, is administered by the Benecon Group, uh, has been the premier health insurance option for municipalities throughout the state of Pennsylvania since uh, 2006. Benecon as a company has um, been uh, administering these uh, this cooperative and, and other consortium since 1991. Uh, the program, PIMIC program, um, that we brought forth for Cheltenham consists of about 275 member, um, member municipality groups across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and like Bob said, it would be utilizing the IBC Independence Blue Cross Network um, the IBC network is the nation's largest provider network, 
and locally in the tri-state, the largest as well. Um, little fact, uh, two thirds of the residents of Cheltenham um, are insured by Independence Blue Cross. Um, and, and this change will give employees and retirees, like Bob said, of the township equal health and prescription drug coverage, as well as a better insurance network for access to doctors and uh, hospitals. Thank you. Yep. Uh, are there comments, questions? Are, are you are you done presenting that, Mr. Manager? Yes. Or are there yes. other? We, we okay. are, yes. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, I would have a comment. Sure. Yep, thank you. Colin. Yeah. Yep, thank you. I I would just um, you know state that you know I think it in in any situation whether you know you're a municipality or you're a for profit entity. Um, I think it's important that, you know, you always periodically go to the market. Um, things change, you know, rapidly, you know, in, in the health space and in other areas as well. Um, so to ensure that you are providing, uh, you know, the best possible option, um, you know, at, at the most efficient delivery model, um, I think it's important, you know, not not only with health insurance, but you know, with with all areas where you know we're using taxpayer funds to make sure that we're we're maximizing the best for our employees, we're maximizing the best for uh, for our residents and our taxpayers as well. So I think it was probably a little bit, you know, long overdue. You know, we haven't looked at this in a while, but I'm glad we we you know we're finally taking that step, and um, you know, look, looking forward to a positive outcome. So thank you for making that comment. Uh, is that, shall I also take that as a motion? You, uh, you can, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. Yeah. So just to add, just uh, um, for the public uh, listening or uh, anybody who uh, sees this on either tape or uh, the notes uh, from this meeting, uh, it should be known and understood that the commissioners and the township staff have been working on this issue. Uh, months would be an understatement. We've been working on it for the past several years, but over the past year, we've put in a lot of time uh, amongst ourselves, uh, meeting with outside vendors, uh, meeting with outside health carriers, um, meeting with the Villanova insurance partners and Benecon, and uh, this, uh, so we've done a very careful review, and as Commissioner Holland stated, uh, a very appropriate review. We had been with DIVIT for many years. Uh, it was very appropriate for us to uh, consider alternatives, um, not uh, for, for service to the township, uh, for service to the uh, employees, as well as for cost reasons. So I want to make it uh, clear that... Um, Whereas it may not seem like there's much discussion among the commissioners pro or con on this tonight, uh, there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of meetings that have taken place prior to this evening. Just a, an additional comment, Mr. Chair, Madam Chairperson, Mr. Sure. President, so everybody knows, we also included divot in the consideration process. So we had a what we considered to be fair comparison before we made the determination. Um, to move on. So I think it's important to know that the incumbent also had an opportunity to, to maintain a, a, and retain the business from the township. And uh, uh, there have been, as you pointed out, meetings have continued basically since 2020 and, and discussions, et cetera. So this is not uh, something that we've come to recently. Thank you. Um, I don't see, oh, okay. Uh, Commissioner Brockington and then I do see some questions in the chat. So I think uh, before we take the vote, we'll, we'll try to address those. But go ahead, um, Commissioner. I, I just wanted to sort of for it to go on the record so someone would know, how is this information going to be shared? I know we've talked about it with our retirees who are not coming into the office every day. How is this change going to be shared with them? I would ask my Villanova partners, insurance partners, 
Sorry, I was uh, I was muted. Um, we will work with uh, the Bob and the township to determine the uh, best method, whether that's um, uh, webinars that um, uh, retirees can attend or that is uh, information sheets mailed uh, to their uh, residents to share with them the information, everything that's going on and the change um, from uh, Aetna to Independence Blue Cross to uh, deliver it in the best method possible. So is it is it possible it can be done in multi ways, in mail and Zoom and Cor things correct. like that? Correct, yeah, whether that's mail, Zoom, um, in person, um, or some com combination com of those. Uh, pending that um, uh, the whole COVID situation, we, we were, Flexible to work of uh, all three different all three of these options to uh, deliver it the best way possible. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Arman. Thank you. Um, one, um, uh, as Commissioner Holland mentioned, it is good, um, in my view, to from time to time go and and look and see if there are efficiencies that could be re, um, achieved and uh, additional benefits that could be provided um, not only by uh, the insurance carriers, but by the township to its employees. Um, and in this process, one of the critical questions I can tell you in these meetings that uh, President Norris mentioned was to not only find those efficiencies and find those benefits, but also to ensure that the township is living up to the commitments that it has made to its employees and retirees over time. And the, um, uh, the folks from, uh, from Villanova partners um, have assured us that um, these plans are as good um, and uh, if not better in many instances than, um, than what we have been dealing with uh, over the course of time. So, um, Everyone should know that that was an important factor. That was a factor that was top of mind, and uh, and it is one that uh, we expect to be delivered as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you all. Um, let, let me go ahead and just read uh, from the chat. Uh, and if if the answers are a little repetitive, uh, that's okay. Uh, I think it's probably worth reiterating. Uh, so the first question is, how do we save money? And well, just to... I can answer that. Uh, one is um, we could save money if the employees would like to pay more, um, which I doubt that's going to going to be a an issue. We are in the process of collecting collective bargaining right now. Um, I think what we're looking at here is there are some potential cost savings, but until we're a year into this plan, I can't guarantee, and I don't think anyone's going to guarantee what those net savings are going to be. Um, so uh, that's, you know, if anybody has anything else further than that, um, I know some of the union reps are on here asking the questions. You know, my door's open as always. They can walk across and ask is always if they had, do have any questions. Um, our hope is that at the end of the day in a year after this goes into to effect, we'll have some concrete numbers as to how we have saved. Um, you know, additional costs of employees. I know one of the questions, how much more are coming out of paychecks? Um, that is a negotiated item. So I really don't want to get into that particular item at this time, but I will say that um, the staff and the board uh, has looked at making sure this coverage matches exactly what Divot is proposing, which it does meet that. Not Divot, Pimic. Pimic, I'm sorry, but it matches what Divot is offering currently. Yep, Ma Madam you, Chair. Yes, please go yeah, ahead. Thank, thank you. Yeah, one, one other thing that I will add is, you know, and to uh, uh, the township manager's point, you know, the, the savings is, is sort of, I don't want to say it's unknown, but, you know, it can ebb and flow. It can change. Um, and we'll know more about that in the future. But, you know, one thing to point out um, is that as, as the delivery of medical services evolves and changes um, and is delivered uh, a variety of different ways, um, one of the, the ways that we can benefit 
um, significantly as a township is if we um, can, you know, modify our behavior um, and how we're used to receiving services over time. Um, very similar to how, you know, probably some of your employers have offered options like telemedicine, um, you know, being able to um, get re uh, prescriptions refilled in bulk rather than having to go, you know, every 30 days, things of that nature. So there's a variety of different ways that, you know, we could benefit as a community um, if, you know, in large numbers, you know, we can utilize some of the more efficient ways of uh, delivering services. So for example, you know, and this may be a little dramatic, but you know, if, if you have a splinter, you don't have to go to the emergency room. You can go to an urgent care, you can go to a different, you know, provider, uh, and you would be surprised, you know, how a small change like that, you know, multiplied over, you know, you know hundreds of, of situations could be um, impactful. Okay, thank you. And another question is, has it gone to bid? I think somebody already answered that, but uh, maybe somebody yes. can elaborate. Yes, Vill Villanova did solicit proposals for that for the township. So yes, we did receive proposals. Okay. Um, the information hasn't yet been shared uh, with employees. Do we have a written proposal with cost and savings? Until we have a finalized uh, plan and proposal, we will be presenting that to the uh, unions in negotiations as well. Uh, so that's where we, we stand on that one. Okay. Um, will folks on the PPO plan still be on a similar plan? Yes, there are PPO as part of this HMO PPO. Yes, and the other thing I'll, I'll add, Bob, is uh, the PPOs will stay as a PPO. And the one benefit is anybody on the HMO plan um, would now uh, be on what's called a POS slash EPO plan. Um, so it's off the HMO network. It is uh, essentially the Blue Cross, Independence Blue Cross um, in network providers, the in-network PPO with no out-of-network uh, coverage compared to the PPO that has in and out-of-network coverage. So it is a, a upgrade, uh, a huge upgrade for anybody that is on the, currently on the HMO uh, plan with that currently. Okay. Um, was there an RFP bid process? I think we answered that one already. Yes. Uh, so the next one is then what is the purpose of switching? But I, that may not have been directly from that question. They sure. have been relating to a previous one. I think from, as earlier I mentioned, uh, again, we need to manage costs as one of the top expenses of the township to look at how we can do better, how we can provide the same, if not better coverage. Uh, I think uh, Villanova Partners has done a great job of working with IBC, where I believe in some areas we may be a little bit better. Uh, so I think that has worked out very well at, at this particular point in time. Um, I know that there was a question regarding uh, retiree health care. Um, that was in here about you can't change retiree health care. That's correct. And we are fully aware of that. Okay, um, there are a lot of the employees that use Divid Health Center as our primary care providers, and we will lose our doctors. Based on the data, uh, and Chris, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, I believe based on the evaluation, about 20% of our employees use the healthcare center, 80% do not. So that is a relatively uh, smaller number. Uh, but again, I think for what Villanova has done to ensure that we will have the same type of center that is available for the staff, you know, I think that uh, speaks volumes for them as well as recognizing that um, 
this is something that, that still would be provided. It may look differently, but again, from the copay aspect and having a facility closer um, for the 20% uh, should uh, provide a benefit. Is it also possible that the uh, primary care providers at that health center are also part of the network that they may be able to retain them? I, I'm just asking that. Uh, Chris, I'll, might I'll they be in the network? Yeah, it, it, I, I don't uh, know exactly. Might be overlap? Yeah, I don't know. It is a possibility that the doctors who work in that center also work um, with another practice, another hospital system um, in the, the area as well. So that is a possibility. I don't know if they're tied to the company um, that uh, David has outsourced to manage that uh, health center. And maybe one thing, if I can just add, and Chris, again, correct me. Um, but I think in a previous conversation we had that uh, as soon as we would enter into an agreement, uh, if so, with IBC, that there is a team that would go out to any doctors that are currently being utilized by our staff to go out to try to enlist them to get into this program so that our staff members would not lose that, I guess, personal care of that physician. Yeah, all, um, all carriers have uh, what they call as a recruitment team um, to um, ensure or help with the recruitment of, of doctors who wouldn't be in the independent Blue Cross network or, or any network you're moving to. Um, and I will just state again that that will be, if any, um, moving from that to the IBC network, especially um, in the southeastern uh, Pennsylvania tri-state area because of IBC's headquarters being right in Philadelphia. But yes, that is, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another question, again, a somewhat repetitive, but maybe something else is intended here. Who else submitted proposals? So as you all have said, we heard from, well, I'll let you guys answer it. In terms of uh, carrier, um, the, the two main carriers in this area that, um, from a coverage perspective, were um, uh, United Healthcare and Independence Blue Cross. Um, and Independence Blue Cross had a much stronger proposal um, from coverage, but also um, from their network in, in this area. We, we did the only other carrier um, to that possibly we go to in this area would be Cigna, um, but their coverage is uh, nowhere near um, uh, IBC, United, or Aetna in in the tri in the southeastern PA area. Okay, and again, we uh, I think you all said that we had heard from Divit, and that would have uh, covered the Aetna, right? Yes, uh, yes. The Bob worked with David to obtain that proposal. Yes. Okay. Um, has this agreement already been signed? No. Okay. Another question. So, will the PPO be in network only then? No. The PPO will be a PPO like it is right now. You'll have in and out of network coverage. That will remain unchanged. You will have the Independence Blue Cross PPO network, which in our area is the Independence Blue Cross and then Keystone. And then outside of the uh, five county area, you will have access to the blue card, um, which is the largest PPO network in the country. The only thing that will change is it's an upgrade for the HMO individuals. They now have access to a larger network and do not have to maintain a, a quote unquote gatekeeper doctor and as many um, uh, referrals um, like they do currently to see a specialist or any of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are quite a few more, it looks like. Are employees subject to a mandatory screening? And if so, will pre-existing conditions be an issue? I believe that is there is the uh, huge difference here is there is no pre-screening pre-existing conditions as this trans transfers over. That's correct. No, no pre-existing condition um, uh, screening or any of that. Everybody is covered 
as of would be covered as of day one, uh, January 1st, 12.01 a.m. Thank you. Um, somebody has said everything has to stay the same. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Um, another question, uh, will those most affected employees and retirees have a chance to review the details of the new proposal before it is enacted. Uh, and to be, before it goes into full effect, yes, that would be something that there would be meetings that we would hold. Uh, and I think this goes back to Irv's question, you know, mailing in-person meetings to make available so everybody fully understands uh, the coverages and then also can contrast and compare to make sure that we are not uh, losing any benefit that's currently enjoyed by the staff. Yeah, I don't know if they're asking about veto power or... They have, there is no veto power. Uh, the contracts are clear of how that works. Um, so I would refer anyone back to their contracts because the language, they have the language for all three. And it's, it's, it's pretty clear what it says that... Um, you know, each one has a little different stipulation. So again, uh, what the contract language is, is we are complying with. Um, how much notice will we get to notify and see if our doctor and specialist take this new insurance? My hope would be that as soon as the board uh, approves this, uh, that we would have at least three months in advance to be able to meet with everybody, to roll out what this plan is, program, get doctors enlisted, changed over, switched over, uh, get the details on the uh, health center, uh, all these details, the health cards, and then also to be able to have a meeting and hopefully nobody takes any offense to this, but spouses and friends would have the opportunity to be part of these meetings, to ask questions, uh, because I know sometimes uh, employees have, uh, you know, they don't hear certain parts of it, so it's good to involve family members so they can answer the questions and get involved and actually understand this. And that's something that I think from Villanova partners, from Chris, from everyone, and even the IBC reps, uh, education, communication is, is key. And I was, um, I'm impressed with how they look to engage in on this process. Okay. Um, there's a comment. Um, we are losing benefit because we are not getting to keep our relationship with our primary doctor. Anybody um, want to? Sure. That there's, one? Sure. There's nothing in the union contracts that say you must keep your own family doctor. Um, again, so that's not in there. Um, again, I think the enlistment, enlisting of this group to get those doctors involved into this uh, program. Uh, is critical and key. So um, that I just want to clarify that point. Thank you. And where will the new health center be located? Uh, I believe that's being finally negotiated. Um, and I, I'm not sure, Chris, if you're able to divulge that look uh, what yeah, particular it's area. Still being negotiated, so not, not quite. Yeah. But it will be closer than the Divot Center. Correct. The township. Okay. Uh, will the union reps get a chance to review the policies before you agree to do this? That's why we have negotiations. And that's why we have meetings that we are scheduling now to be able to go through these. Um, if we use the center, we do, oh, I think we had that one before. If we use the center, we do not get to keep our primary doc. That may or may not be true, right? I'm not sure who their primary doctors are. Um, and I'm sure that there will be a change to that. But again, I think the health center is something that um, was an added addition by Divot. Um, and it's something that we recognize that it's important to that 20% of our staff members that we do get that included into this program. So uh, there was acknowledging of that. 
and this is something that we want to keep in the in the program. So um, I think we, we're accomplishing that goal. Okay. And um, what information is the board using to vote on this if we don't know if we are saving money? What is the purpose? Uh, there are proposals that we have been in negotiations with, with um, uh, that as we continue to negotiate these, uh, they are not uh, in that realm of discussing those full numbers. And again, those are estimates. So I would hate to say that the township's going to save a dollar, is going to save $100,000 when we have to wait for a full year of the health care provision to see if what actually we'll realize in those cost savings. Okay, I think I skipped one or missed one or something. So this is going uh, going to be negotiated, not approved next board meeting. And there's a question. So this is going to be negotiated, not approved next board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's more the way it was meant to be read. Right. Yes. Just to, I'll jump in there, just to be clear, what we're voting on, or what we're discussing, is that the commissioners are giving the staff the direction to proceed with Villanova Insurance Partners and IBC as our health insurance proposal, which will be taken to the unions. Bob, did I state that correctly? Correct, that is correct, to finalize an agreement. Okay, um, are we there yet? <laughs> we do have the motion on the floor. Have we addressed the question? Is yeah, there let's something take a else? vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Aye. Madam Chair, I will address a final question that did come in. It says whether this is negotiable with the unions. Uh, that is interesting, interesting point. Um, typically, the way the contracts are written, and they're pretty clear that you have to provide this service. Um, if the unions are going to propose uh, increasing their contributions, uh, that would be great. Um, or they're proposing something different, uh, would love to hear that. Uh, but we are complying with the contract agreements. There is complete compliance with the union agreements that have been previously negotiated and agreed to and approved by both the unions and the township. Okay, so um, I, think, I think we're done with that one and we'll go on to uh, new business B. Um, consider recommend, Sanders. yes. If I may recommend, Kransky. we do a B and C together because they are related rather than having two discussions. I have no problem with that. Um, consider recommending the Board of Commissioners approve a website upgrade through Municipal One CMS in two phases at the cost of $12,500 with an annual hosting fee of $3,400 uh, as the materials indicate uh, in the uh, latter part of the agenda and C, consider recommending the Board of Commissioners approve implementation of Municipal Engage, an on-demand mass notification, text, and email subscription through Municipal One at a cost of $3,000 annually, C attached, which we have. Does anyone want to uh, uh, summarize it for the public? A great deal of time was spent on this by a committee of commissioners and staff. Uh, a number of vendors were vetted. The cost savings here were significant compared to other vendors reinventing our site. Um, staff did a wonderful job in getting out their two by four and negotiating pricing. Um, and to that end, some certain fees were reduced. Um, this will save us substantially over what other vendors offered and will greatly increase our capabilities over time. Madam Chairperson? Yes, Commissioner Sigmund Um, I think the important thing for our residents as well as folks that use the website to understand is we recognize many of the issues in terms of 
um, poor navigation, limited communication, limited utility. So, you know, we're not just doing this for the purpose of, you know, quote unquote, a conceptual upgrade or to save money. The truth is that we know that this website has many issues in terms of our ability to navigate and get to, to matters that are important to the residents quickly and efficiently. And what we've seen is with Municipal One and with the changes that are recommended, this will be much more functional. It will be much more user-friendly. And many of the things that bog somebody down in getting to the particular issues that they want are gonna, is gonna be eliminated. So I think this is, you know, it's a significant improvement. We've seen the things that uh, this, this vendor, this provider can do that others, you know, couldn't do for the same amount of dollars. And I think it, you know, that uh, uh, what will happen from this is to have a much better uh, experience every time you go on our website. Commissioner Norris. So I don't, I'm not going to repeat what Commissioner Zygmunt Feld stated because he stated it so well, but uh, this will, this has been talked about for a long time. The shortcomings in our website, the need for improvement. Um, we have taken our time uh, to uh, uh, work with outside parties and come up with a, uh, what we are sure will be a new and improved website. I just wish to add uh, special thanks to Commissioner Pransky for all his extra hours working with our township staff uh, to, uh, to get us to this point. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners? I do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, and I also thank, thank everybody who's been working on it. Um, it, it presented the, um, the $12,500 for the first year. Um, but what, what wasn't clear to me is that the year ends in June um, and uh, by the time we approve this and it gets up and running, um, it'll really be only six months. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's not a reasonable thing, but I, I think it's kind of a, a misinterpretation or a misstatement that it, it's that for the first year. I think that is the get it up and running cost. And then the first actual year starts in you know, in June, next June or July as it, as it is. Yeah. Um, first of all, the whole lump sum isn't paid at once. They're paid in part as they put it together. Secondly, this is the total over whatever period of time it goes to put this up. And then all we pay from that point forward is the annual maintenance and hosting fee and the um, extra, the other fee for the municipal engage. But right, so it's really, it's really just to get it up and running yeah. until June, right? Well, until whatever, you know, the launch day is, yeah. Well, I mean, be because it talks, in the document, it talks about uh, starting in June 22, that's when the second year begins. So, yeah, it's talking about renewal in June of 22. All right, but that, I think, I think Bob, you can clear this up. That was the original proposal document they sent to us. That'll be updated as, a, as of our acceptance so that it's Correct. a year from our acceptance. Correct. We can backdate it to before we- So we actually do get a year. And oh, that yes. Is not oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Okay. I didn't know that's where right. your confusion was, but yes, absolutely. Right. Well, that's what the document says. So no, but I'll say that, that was the original what, proposal document. Yeah, I understand. Okay. That. And that's already out of date. Okay. Um, another question I had, um, just to clarify again, the it talks about, uh, you know, there are asterisks uh, with uh, the various uh, convenience fees for online payments, uh, plus a dollar thirty for transact per transaction. Uh, did, did anybody, are, are we doing that? And did anybody estimate what those costs might, might also be? And have we decided whether those are being passed on or whether we are uh, 
covering that. Either way, I guess it gets passed on, but are we doing, are we availing ourselves of that? Mom? Allison, I'll go to you. I believe I no one believe of you two that. had decided on this one. <laughs> no, no we're, we're, we're just doing the uh, website update itself um, in two phases. One is the quick facelift um, phase, which is basically going to um, keep all the information where it is right now, um, but make it look different and easier to navigate. And then the second phase, which will take a little bit longer, will um, have the web designer go through and help us reorganize and reduce some of the pages on there to help make things easier to find and navigate. Um, we do have stuff that's been on there for probably a little too long. Um, the the um, municipal engage, which is another um, annual fee, the $3,400 is, is kind of um, more of an on-demand version of what we have, uh, which is the, uh, the e-blast that goes out at 530. This will allow us to put it out whenever we want instead of being limited to that one time a day. So if an emergency pops up at 10 a.m., we can get the information out then. Um, and it'll also allow us to start collecting um, cell phone numbers so that we can get information out to people with cell phone numbers because sometimes that's a better way to get out. But uh, no, the plan isn't right now to do any online stuff. Okay, so it says on, on page of their document, page 32, it says in phase two, the redesign services, it includes setup of municipal one pay for online payments and setup of municipal engage for on-demand messaging. And again, those are what, you know, are um, the fees that I was just mentioning, the, the 3.9% plus uh, $1. thirty per transaction. And that's all included in the $8,000, which is included in the $12,500. So I'm asking, when it, are we going to be using those things? And if so, uh, those are those new fees, the 3.9 and the $1.30 per transaction. And have we done any calculation as to what that's gonna cost us? I'm just gonna speak. So I'm, go ahead, Allison. I'm sorry, could you tell me what page that's on? Because I apologize, I didn't have it in front it's, of me. It's, it's on page 32, 32 of their proposal. Again, I think it would have helped if we had updated this from them before that was put out. Um, there are some of these services. You know me, I got to read these things, right? No, no, no. I mean, there, there are some, there are, I didn't, literally having seen it so many times, I didn't really scan through it again. And Allison is looking through it, but there are some of the services we are not going to use because they're not cost effective. Um, and I believe Allison, if I'm correct, that's one of them. Uh, well, then it shouldn't be part of setting up in the eight thousand dollars that goes into the twelve thousand five hundred dollars that we're approving. I think that's sort of standard as far as what they do when they do the whole setup. It's not like an individual thing that they have to do separately. They have you, they have a content management system. And this is included in that. So the setup would include that. Whether we ever avail ourselves of the service is not, a, not, not, not an issue. We're not paying extra for something. And um, the 3.9% the plus 130 transaction fee, that would be passed on to whoever purchases the, the purchaser. Um, it's similar to the program we use for our taxes um, through Municipay. Which charge um, for credit cards. Yeah, I hear and on municipal okay. engage, there is no extra cost to sign up for this service. There is no charge. There is no fee for that. That is all included in there. And the more people we can sign up, the better. Even uh, I will reach out to the school district to try to get teachers to also sign up for this in case there is any mass message that we want to be able to get out that we'd be able to hit the teaching staff as well, that they would be aware that okay, something great. is happening. Good. Um, and the business community. One or two other real quick ones, and I'm sure sure you've already covered it. Um, I know that you said in phase one, we're going to save the old content. Um, I know this has come up before uh, and in a lot of transitional um, 
situations, there's still a lot of stuff that we don't want to necessarily clean out that we want to save just because of his, you know, we, there may be documents or um, press releases that we need to go back and check for one reason or another. Um, I'm concerned that we don't, we need a place to store it, whether it's a cloud situation or what. And I wanna make sure it is, it remains accessible to the township in some format so that we can go back to an archive of some kind and retrieve it uh, even five years hence. We, we actually so, did discuss that with them. And I think uh, Allison, correct me, I didn't think we, I don't think we got a fine point on it, but we talked about subdomain and everything else where this stuff would be. Uh, so it doesn't clutter up the main site, but it's available there from the site. Yeah, there's, there is a bunch of stuff that really does not need to be up there. There's stuff that's up there that maybe could be rewritten to have it, um, you know, sure. look a little better sure. and read better. So it's, it's trying to uh, make it easier for residents who may not know what they're looking for to find what they're looking for and get the right. The and no argument with that. I, I think the concern is that we need to maintain the content and be able to access it somewhere whenever we need it going forward. So six months holding on to it in some form isn't enough. We need some kind of storage device or mechanism so that we can, several years hence, go back and retrieve it if we are looking for it. Are you talking about the content of the website or content that, that pertains to the township itself? Because the only things that are on the website is information posted by the township. So the original information, whatever was the basis of the post, still resides with the township. Yeah, and the question is, where will it be when it when the new content goes forward? Um, and how will we uh, access it when the new content is there? Uh, there may be reports and press releases and other things that right now we can retrieve through whatever mechanism we do it. You know, I'm on there all the time looking for older documents. And just because yeah. it may not be relevant now uh, to most people, and I don't think it should be clogging up the website. I think it needs, though, to be available to people who do need to go back and look at it. We, we will definitely, that'll be part of the process is taking a look at, at some of these documents and kind of weighing whether or not it is something that would be, you know, relevant to future research, current or future research. And some of it will be, hey, this, this is really out of date and it's been replaced or supplanted by something else. So we'll, we'll be taking a look at everything and, and trying to make a concerted and educated um, plan for moving forward with the information that stays on that website. Uh, comment, Commissioner Rappaport. When I did, yeah, I kind of did a um, an evaluation, just looking at at how much legacy content was in our website. It's probably somewhere between fifty five and sixty percent of our website is legacy content that that's outdated. So part of what the content management system and our efforts have to be is to organize it into functions and into ways that you can access that information. If you tell me that you're now coming going into the system and easily finding documents, I would tell you congratulations because this system is so user unfriendly that it makes it very difficult to find things. So part of our task, the staff and some of us who have spent a lot of time here, is to improve the organization and figure out the more useful access of that information. So things that are on developments, if you go to development right now, it's all over the place. What we need to do is have all that organized. So I, what I would tell you is it's incumbent on us to take advantage of the tools that this system is going to bring to us that we haven't Pardon. done so far. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure I, I'm making my point. Um, yeah, nobody's arguing that it shouldn't be upgraded, more user-friendly, more 
uh, administratively friendly. I'm making the point though, that I don't think we need to be the curators of what goes into the cloud. Do whatever you want as far as upgrading by modern standards. But I'm saying the content that is currently there, um, we don't want it all. You can edit it all, all you want for the new website. That doesn't mean it shouldn't go into a cloud for, uh, you're calling it legacy purpose, but also for archival and retrieval purposes. So I, I think, I can't make it any clearer, but I no, I don't think we're the curators for what the taxpayer may want to go back and look for later. So we can curate what's on our site and how it's presented. I think that's great. We've been trying to do this for ages, no argument. I'm just making a case uh, as many people have for making sure that we do not lose what's there, that it has to go somewhere else where we do have access. Um, and I think, I think okay. that's what I answered, but not very clearly, apparently. Um, uh, okay. we, we were discussing with them ways of handling that. Um, it may be a subdomain of the site. It may just be a link to a whole separate section of the site that opens up with old content or whatever. Right. Uh, I'm right. sure at some point we'll hit a storage limit where they say to us, no, you can no longer store 27 terabytes of information of, of things from 1903 on our site. And we might have to make other cloud storage arrangements. Right. But right. You know, at, at the moment and for the foreseeable future, uh, we are already dealing with that. Good to hear. And that, and that that goes beyond the six months because that was what was part of the issue goes beyond phase one. And then, and the, that was part of the other uh, two questions were, I think I saw somewhere and I, I don't know where it was, 30, was it 30 gigabyte storage? Does anybody know what that number was? I assume you guys are aware of that and you feel it's, it's enough. That's actually a lot for most websites. We're not well, doing transactional stuff, so I don't, I don't. All right, and that was part of the other question. All right, good. Um, and finally, I think it said something about doing surveys, uh, getting getting the public uh, uh, involved. Um, I guess part of what I'm asking is, I know that the company uh, mentioned a um, a test, you know. That's not quite the same as a beta, a beta site uh, where it's, you know, where there's an actual usage uh, released to the public so that the public has access and also can get feedback, give feedback to improving or things that they are having trouble with or, you know, that kind of public feedback. And it wasn't clear that that would be edited in that price format that we were given. So uh, could somebody please address that? You want me to take a stab, Bob? Sure. I see everybody else backing away from the mic. Uh, the, the first step is just gonna be reskinning the site. What that means is everything that was there will be there. It'll just look a little bit different. In the second phase, when they start to restructure it, they'll be showing it to us as we go through it. And we'll have ample opportunity to critique if there are any other navigational issues or things that have to be changed. As far as going out to the public and having a thousand voices telling us what the site should look like, that's highly unlikely. Um, you know, one of my favorite expressions is the definition of a camel in the Middle East. It's a horse designed by a committee. Okay. So, we, we don't want to turn this into a camel, but there will be enough eyes on it from staff and commissioners to be able to make the adjustments that we need. Well, except that I, if our ultimate user is the public, then again, the, there's an argument and if, and if that thing, a beta site would serve uh, for that, yeah, that navigation. I understand what you're saying. And if things come up where somebody says, you know, I looked at the new site and I'm having a problem with this, 
that's part of their maintenance. They can always adjust that and change it. All right, you're, you're considering that, they're considering that part of their maintenance agreement. Yes, if it, if it, I, I can't see any reason why if something doesn't work properly for us, that they wouldn't modify it. I mean, that is any event. Okay, well, I, it could be argued that that's part of the design rather than maintenance, and that's what was the question. C CM, CMS, content management systems, handle the data. All right, they're building the site for what we need, and the data goes on that framework. If we need to modify something on the framework, change, change this navigation, change this menu structure, add a link to this, that's not a big issue. They can do that in you know, a couple minutes. That's not a problem. Right. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion. I so think moved. that's more than enough questions. So All in moved. favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, I think we're at old business on public affairs. Um, anybody? Madam um, Chair? Yes. I know you had asked in regards to um, the list for uh, $10,000 funding for the CTC um, that was asked for. I know I got some feedback uh, from police and public works if you'd like me to go through that list at this point That's, or? That would be great because we wanna be able to give it to that organization so that they can then start the paperwork. Thank okay. you. Um, from the police, they were looking at, uh, we currently have cameras at Roland in Lamont uh, Community Centers. Uh, the suggestion is we probably need more lighting around both. And the skate park and wall park um, would be a good spot for a camera and lighting, as well as the lot on Tookany by Griffin Field is what the police recommendation is. And the public works recommendation is wall park, the skate park and parking lot uh, for camera and lighting, as well as veterans memorial field, basketball court, playground and parking lot. Um, the Glenside Hall, all three sides, uh, plus the basketball court area off Parkside Lane. Um, public works facility, the front walkway and ramp to the entrance. A Curtis Arboretum uh, for the hall and wedding area, the lower parking lot. Um, there is, isn't the best of lighting at that facility and Thomas Williams Park, the tennis court and rear parking lot area. Those are the feedback from police and public works, which I think both they're, they're good suggestions. Okay, can we get that in writing then to forward sure. to? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, all right, any other old business for public affairs? Uh, any announcements? Yes, I think we're finished. <laughs> Citizens Forum for Public Affairs. All right, Brad, we'll, we'll take your- I'll make uh, a motion to adjourn. Motion to Fair. adjourn. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Good night, Good night, Good night guys. Stay safe out there.